So I guess I'm one of those good old-fashioned AI people. So uh, uh, when I started to do research in artificial intelligence, we were really about doing this knowledge representation. So I actually come from the knowledge representation uh, kind of laboratory at uh, Linköping University. Uh, so I actually would argue that we have a lot to, to learn from this uh, traditional te techniques to artificial intelligence as, as well. Uh, but of course, today we have a lot of machine learning to assist and to uh, improve on those uh, technologies. Uh, so what I'm interested in, in sharing here, the idea that I think is worth sharing here today, is that how do we go from all these exciting and very fascinating results that we see in artificial intelligence, uh, which is really about understanding how we can mechanize uh, intelligence or thought processes, cognitions and so on, and how do we leverage that uh, when it comes to our own prob uh, problem-solving uh, capabilities and abilities. Uh, and I would argue that we can actually uh, both learn a lot from artificial intelligence, but also uh, take advantage of the fact that we have extremely powerful computers when we solve problems. So what we really need to do is to uh, develop and cultivate our computational thinking, uh, leveraging uh, this computational power that exists while solving problems. So, I mean, what is artificial intelligence? So uh, as the president of the Swedish AI Society, uh, I do get uh, asked this question quite a lot. Um, but I think from the purpose of this talk at least, I would just say that artificial intelligence is really kind of the study of uh, the algorithmic mechanization of cognition. Uh, where cognition is how do we think, how do we solve problems, how do we plan, how do we reason, and so on. Uh, so how do we get to understand it well enough and are being able to write algorithms that can actually carry out the same kind of uh, problem-solving processes, for example. So uh, we have seen uh, that in, in the previous examples that we have made quite good progress and we have come quite far. So I mean, one question we can ask is why now? Why are we here today uh, showing these kind of advances? Well, first of all, software is eating the world. So basically, software is taking over uh, where we previously had hardware, for example. Uh, one, just bringing one example is the uh, Ericsson Telecom Networks, uh, where previously you had uh, specialized hardware uh, in specialized base stations. And if you want to change the feature of your uh, telecom network, someone has to physically go there, replace the hardware. Uh, today, they just have a standard uh, computer, uh, and they just change the software. So if you want a new feature in your telecom network, you just change the software, and everything works the same. And the same is for cars, where you can have the same engine in several models of the car. The only difference is that if you pay 100,000 more, you get the sports edition, which means that it has a different software than in the standard edition. So software is continually eating the world. And it's also the fact that it's not only the digital world, but also the analog world uh, are actually merging. So what we see is that things that we do in the digital world has consequences in the analog world or the physical world. And of course, the other way around, that the things that we do in the physical world have consequences uh, in, the, in the digital world. That's kind of easier to see. Uh, but it's actually been the case that uh, there was a reporter who um, had uh, epilepsy, and there was someone who was angry at him, they didn't like what he was writing, and actually sent him a file uh, they, they opened this file and it started to blink. And it's like a stroboscope effect and it actually caused a seizure for him. So it's actually a way of attacking a person through a digital media. So uh, the digital world and the analog world are truly becoming one. Uh, so that's another interesting fact. Of course, then we also have this development in computational powers. We have the graphical processing unit. So uh, thanks to all the kids uh, playing a lot of video games at home, uh, we today have uh, the massive computational powers that we have today that we need for all of this machine learning and so on. But we also have a lot of labeled data. We actually have examples. So again, it's basically us here using our mobile devices or other things to collect data continuously uh, that allows these uh, machine learning algorithms to, to learn from the data that we have available. And finally, of course, there's also improvement in algorithms due to research. But it's interesting that what we see is this kind of convergence of a number of different factors that makes all of this possible. Uh, 
So why is this important then? Why should we care? Well, first of all, what we've seen is this machine learning can actually find these complex patterns and, and extract them. So previously we had to spend a lot of effort in, in uh, defining these ourselves. Now they can be extracted much more efficiently and at scale. Uh, and it also allows for adaptation. So it's not a fixed system, but rather it can change and evolve and adapt at runtime. So it becomes much more uh, flexible and, of course, then much more useful. What we also see is that the interface uh, to computers is becoming much more based on natural language. So, I mean, in some sense you can see it. I mean, the Google search box is kind of interesting. It's just, it's just a box. Enter anything you like and it will answer any kind of questions you have. Uh, and what we see today is that, uh, of course, that we are evolving this. So previously it was this kind of one question system or question answering system. Uh, of course, Google is one example. This IBM Watson is a different example. You, you ask it a question, it comes back with an answer. So what we are starting to see now is dialogues. So you actually have a conversation uh, with your computer or your, your system and it understands you and keeps uh, track of history and uh, can respond in a meaningful manner. Uh, so uh, the, the kind of low-hanging fruit there is all uh, customer support uh, uh, functions at companies. So this is very much in, in the process of being taken over by these kind of avatars. Uh, but then if we look at more physical uh, entities like robots. So what I would say is the really interesting thing with a robot is that it allows physical presence anywhere, at any time. Uh, that, I mean, you, previously you had to be somewhere to physically interact with that particular location. Now, by having a robot, uh, you can actually be at any place, any place at least that where there is a robot. And you can be at many places, physical places, at the same time. So I think that, or those things, are what's really interesting with robotics. And uh, I mean, taking all this together is that what we have seen previously is like relatively, what should I say, simple or um, uh, repetitive, repetitive work being taken over by automation. But what we see today, especially if you look at systems like IBM Watson, is that knowledge work uh, is very much ripe for automation. And it's actually the kind of professional work which requires a lot of knowledge, a person to gather a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge, and then being able to ask questions, uh, uh, do diagnosis, or uh, suggest treatments, and so on. Those are the kind of jobs which are currently being targeted by these kind of systems. So think, for example, lawyers. There are currently systems that are giving legal advice much more uh, efficient, much faster, much cheaper, and also with higher accuracy than, than humans. And it's also the fact that uh, you have, again, if you take the, the IBM Watson example, what they're trying to do now is, of course, go into the medical business, uh, as supporting uh, doctors in making medical diagnosis. So uh, it's actually very interesting to see what are the consequences of this, and, and it is important for all of us. So, on this note, I think it's very interesting to look at the game of chess. So, the game of chess uh, has been a game where we humans don't have a chance. So, uh, since um, Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov uh, in 1997, I believe it was, actually 20 years ago, uh, people haven't had a chance in a game of chess. Uh, but what's interesting is that even if humans cannot beat computers, it's actually the fact that humans are becoming increasingly much better at chess. And the reason they are becoming better is because they are using the chess programs to train. So they get more effective training through these uh, computerized chess players. And the second is that the interest for, for chess is still very high. So I mean, uh, now that uh, Magnus Carlsen is playing and so on, that generates tremendous interest, even though that humans are not the best. But to kind of make the, th the third point, which is uh, the most interesting one, is that uh, even though computers are better than humans, if you combine humans and computers together in teams, uh, which they do in something called freestyle chess, uh, where you have 
uh, one or more humans uh, playing together with one or more chess computers. And they are better than both the humans and the computers. So of course there is very interesting that we complement each other. That humans uh, have some strength and the computers have some strength. Let's leverage that and become even better together. So in my, in my mind, it's not either computers or humans. It's more both. It's uh, computers and humans together, uh, collaborating. And uh, since, since uh, I think this is very important, I have also been heavily involved in education. Uh, so how do we take this understanding and move it into education? So uh, the concept that I have been promoting is the concept of computational thinking, which is basically a problem-solving process to describe, analyze, and solve problems in such a way that computers can assist. And often we use techniques from computer science. Because in my mind, computer science is really about how do we mechanize problem solving. I mean, already from the start when Alan Turing uh, basically invented computer science during, during the Second World War, his goal was we need to be better at solving this problem, namely cracking the, the German code. And we need help with that. And therefore, he invented this. And we have been studying the, the computational properties of problem solving or computational computation in general. Uh, so uh, we really argue that this is the kind of skills that people need to develop. So what is it? Well, I mean, what are the actual kind of concrete uh, components? Of course, it's giving step-by-step -step instruction, actually instructing a computer or uh, a person to do things. It's decomposing problems into smaller parts, breaking uh, problems down, uh, finding patterns. Again, this is what uh, machine learning is very good at. And how do we then taking these patterns and uh, creating abstractions or more general models from the specifics? And finally, designing algorithms to actually mechanize uh, parts or all of the problem-solving process. So these are usually the basic components of the computational thinking. So to take a concrete example, so since I work with the, the National Agency for Education, uh, we actually have the government just decided a, or yeah, uh, uh, added, made a new uh, curriculum for the K-9 to education here in Sweden, which now involves programming. And as I've been part of that process in developing this new curriculum, uh, I've been using this, this example to, to uh, show what we mean. So assume you want to teach the kids to do uh, regular uh, polygons. Uh, so in this case, do a square. And one way to sh for the kids to show that they understand what a square is, make a program that draws a square. And, uh, and one example would be to use S Scratch, which is one particular programming language for doing that. And to do that in Scratch, you basically would write a program like this. You, you, you have to understand that the square consists of four uh, sides. And to draw a side, you, you move 100 steps, and then you turn 90 degrees. And you go 100 steps, you turn 90 degrees, you go 100 steps, turn 90 degrees go one and steps, and then you have done your, your, your square. But then you would, what is the commonality here? You want to find the patterns. So of course the pattern is to repeat something four times. Uh, so you do draw the, the, the line four times and you turn, and you repeat that four times. And then you say, oh great, now you're done a square. How can you do a, a pentagon? Uh, of course, what do you need to change? Well, you, can ch you have to change the four into a five. Everyone can understand that. But what happens if you change the 100 into 200? Well, you get a square with uh, twice as long sides and uh, four times as much area. So you can talk about the relation between uh, uh, circumference and, and area. Uh, so what we need to change is, of course, how much we actually turn. Uh, and then either you can be like me, you can compute it, or you can be lazy like me and just say, oh, well, you have to do 360 degrees. Uh, well, you did four times 90 in the first case, so now you have to do four ti uh, five times, uh, what is it, 72.5 or something like that, uh, in order to get a full square. And now you can generalize this even further and uh, construct an algorithm for drawing an arbitrary polygon. Uh, basically, just asking for how many sides and repeating this. So in this particular simple example, we've gone through all these different steps. We have decomposed, we have found the patterns, we have generalized, and we have designed an algorithm for solving this. Uh, but it's not only about skills. It's also about attitudes, like confidence in dealing with complexity, 
problems with many different components, uh, working with difficult problems and persistence. So, I mean, this is one of the major challenges, persistence. How do you get the students to not give up but actually continue in solving these problems? Tolerance for ambiguity, the ability to deal with open-ended problems. How do we take an open-ended problem and narrow it down into something that we can actually solve? And maybe we can even, just by narrowing it down and juicing this fact that we have the computational tools to our advantage. And finally, also the ability to communicate and work with others uh, to achieve a common goal. So it's really about com communicate or, and collaborating. You cannot do things by your own. You have to uh, work together. Uh, whether you work together with people or with computers, that does not matter that much. I mean, you have to collaborate because the interesting problems that we need to solve these days are not problems that a single individual can solve by, the, or by themselves. Uh, so, therefore, I think that computational thinking really captures uh, what we need to be good at in order to leverage all this artificial intelligence and other computational tools that we have. So what's uh, interesting here is that as we learn more about artificial intelligence and as we develop these tools uh, based on, for example, machine learning, uh, we need to be able to leverage them through our computational thinking by being able to understand how the computational processes work and how we can benefit from those when we solve problems. So what we see today is actually a number of interesting cases where people use uh, machine learning or other tools as part of their own problem-solving process. And to just give the single concrete example was this, writing these reports on what jobs are likely to be automated by actually learning a model of uh, uh, what are the factors that influence uh, the risk of being taken over by automation. And of course, as we are getting better at this, we can, of course, develop better artificial intelligence tools. So uh, by becoming better at using the tools, we also become better at developing them further. Uh, so I think this is really interesting interconnection between these two and also the fact that uh, we, uh, as people, can benefit from having this tool at our disposal and becoming better at solving problems. So kind of to, to summarize, I think it's, it's not either or, it's together. Together with machines and together with these uh, very sophisticated tools, we can solve the problems that we face as a society. And maybe you can see this as some next step in evolution, taking uh, this synergy between man and artificial intelligence. Thank you very much.